All right, thank you guys for joining us today. Today we will be discussing Just My Type. My name is Adrian O'Donnell and I'm the Educations Program Manager at the Printing Museum. We are a 40 year old institution here in Houston, Texas, and we are more than just a history museum. We are the Printing Museum where we talk about history and art and technology of printing. We have rotating gallery space where we have space for all these different shows. We have special events. We have the steamroller from Rocket and Roll and Prints coming up with Print Matters on October 3rd. If you're able to make that, please come out and see. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we also have working artist studios. And so we've got artists in residence that are able to make use of our letterpress studio, our book bindery, paper making, and printmaking studio. So we have a lot going on. We're really excited. Glad you guys have joined us here today. So I will be handing it off here to Mike in a second. I'll be around helping with the chat. If you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat. You know, we'll also take questions at the end or if there's something that you really wanna ask, we can, you know, we are happy to have a discussion and talk. So let us know, I'm handing it off to Mike. Thank you guys for joining us. Hello everyone from uh, Spring, Texas, next to Houston, Texas. I'm Mike McGinley. As Adriana said, uh, we have a number of great docents at the uh, Printing Museum here, and uh, we decided to do some book reviews uh, for everybody's uh, pleasure and information, and um, most of them focused, we hope, on printing of some uh, nature or some theme. So what we'll do is a quick book review here. I think we'll have time for questions. Um, there's a lot to go through. I'm not doing a page by page book review or chapter by chapter, just trying to pick out some highlights for us. And uh, hopefully that'll entice you to uh, get a copy and read this as a great introduction to type. Very good. So here we are, of course, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Anybody recognize uh, those lyrics that I altered a little bit down there? We'd love to take you to the printing museum. So, <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> so a quick outline. We'll look at the book um, from a physical point of view, uh, sort of a quick discussion about what type is, since that's what the uh, book's uh, theme is, author, uh, genre, a couple of highlights as topics. Again, uh, the book is so chock full of everything that I can't, it's hard to pick and choose what to, uh, what to really focus on, but I'll give you some flavor of how the uh, author uh, approaches the topics. Uh, pros and cons, as I see them, and maybe you'll share some. Uh, what we'd recommend you read next, certainly comments and questions, and uh, certainly consider visiting us, we hope, at the end of the, uh, at some point in the future. Okay, well, here's the book, and I apologize for um, the screen clippings. Uh, they may not be, you know, terribly uh, in focus or, or uh, pixelated, but we, um, there's a play on the word type, um, type meaning maybe type of person, type of personality. Uh, but in this case, of course, it means uh, typeface or type that's used, uh, what you see even on the screen there, you know, uh, for the book and all the other words you see on the screen. So uh, we can't judge the book by its cover, but what can you judge? The type of book. Type of book, that would be the genre, yep. Yeah. How about what we're looking at here on the screen and all the and the illustration of all the other little books there? That was also play on words by the yep. word type. Uh huh. Yep. So we've got uh, the um, the book. We have the content, and we have the book as a physical object, don't we? And uh, you can see here if you go to a bookstore or you're in the airport or whatever. There's lots of books uh, that are all lined up. And the first thing we see, of course, is the cover, right? And um, just like you'd see a food label, right, on uh, barbecue sauce or something like that in the store. And of course, this is in the designer realm, but uh, they have to uh, pick uh, color, they have to pick uh, font type, um, they have to pick images, uh, they have to announce the title of the book, they have to say who it's by and kind of what it's about. So, I think this book is kind of good in terms of its um, design overall. I mean, the black uh, top and bottom panels, the bright red central panel does stand out. Uh, it's a gold uh, embossed um, title there, which is also quite handsome, I guess. 
And uh, then it tells, it says who it's by, Simon Garfield, and uh, what it's all about. Um, so I think it's pretty successful that way. It probably would stand out on the shelf there. And if you're interested, you know, the uh, product details there come from Amazon. So it's pretty long. It's uh, 384 pages, uh, but they go quickly. And uh, according to Amazon, you know, classification, it's in typography. It's also in design and calligraphy. So uh, if you want to uh, go to Amazon, you can certainly look this up, but you could also look under typography and see a bunch of other books on, on the topic uh, that we're looking at here. The, this whole topic of typography has really just kind of uh, exploded over the past few decades. So this is uh, maybe a little sidebar. Uh, let's try to understand what we mean by type, uh, font, and sort as sort of uh, some of the basic uh, vocabulary uh, in the uh, field. We could start at the top or the bottom and work in either direction. But a typeface is sort of, um, I think this is an interesting uh, definition here, a design concept for lettering. So it's design and it's concept or it's conceptual. We're not actually to the point of creating letters yet, uh, designing them, you know, either through a program or freehand. We're kind of thinking of a, um, a concept, you know, what do we want to get across? What does the typeface, uh, what would it be used for? Who's the audience? Who's the client? What would it advertise? What would we, would we use it for reading or just uh, again on a, uh, you know, branding on, um, you know, something in the grocery store. Uh, it's all around us. I mean, you just walk into a store again or whatever, you'll see all sorts of typefaces and they were all designed for a particular purpose. So I think this whole uh, idea of, of typeface being a design concept is quite fascinating. And if you study graphic design, you know, there's a whole uh, iterative process you go through to come up with successful designs like book covers, you know, with your client. So the font is uh, typeface variations in size, weight, and style. So size, of course, will be, say, the point size. You know, I can make, make it bigger, smaller. Weight would be, say, like ultra thin to bold, et cetera. Um, style could be from regular to bold to italic, et cetera. So there's many different variables that you can um, take into the typeface. Uh, sometimes you just want a very limited set of variables. Other typefaces will have, you know, almost unlimited variables. And the font family is the collection of all the fonts. So over here to the side, we have uh, four little examples here. So uh, part of uh, the Printing Museum's uh, style book is to use uh, Benton Sands Regular, which actually showed up in PowerPoint, which was interesting. And uh, regular, bold, italic, and bold, italic. And those were the four easy things you can do with the drop down menu, you know, in PowerPoint as well as Word, etc. So now we finally get down to the little itty bitty pieces here and um, the proper name would be glyphs, but we all often call them characters. Uh, these will be your letters, numbers, punctuation, ligators, anything else you can think of that, you know, makes up the, um, the pieces uh, in any language, you know, that is uh, put into a, a type face and a font and a font family. Uh, in the uh, you know Western tradition is which which the book focuses on. It's kind of limited, but um, you'd be surprised. There's quite a few um, glyphs that you have to consider. And if we're talking about the old cast metal type, uh, you know, which was used up through and even used today at the uh, printing museum, that's called the sort. The little tiny bit of lead is called the sort. I think uh, you know this whole notion of type, uh, face, font, sorts, etc., is really an art and science. Uh, an art in terms of des uh, design and a science in terms of execution. Um, it's not really the key topic today, but it's fascinating to read about that. So if you're ambitious and you want to design a typeface, uh, Windows has a glyph list four, requires 657 Unicode characters. So it's not just 26 uh, letters and numbers and punctuation, maybe that adds up to 100 or so maybe more, but uh, if you wanted to do this, this may include uh, Cyrillic, so you would get in Eastern European languages. Uh, it would not include, you know, Asian languages like Chinese and Japanese though. Uh, so uh, that's pretty hefty. And so you do your regular, uh, you know, type thing, then you have to turn around and do it bold and you have to turn around and do it italic. And <laughs> so the list goes on. So this number grows exponentially, um, but it's a lot of work, even if you're doing this digitally. So uh, that's quite fascinating. 
um, again, this is sort of a, a little bit of a sidebar. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll move on, but uh, just help me. Okay, but we're not done yet, are we? Uh, as Billy Mays would say, if you remember this uh, oxy clean or whatever it was, I forget. Uh, but uh, if you go to myfont.com, myfont.com, you can look up all sorts of typefaces, uh, or type font families, etc. And here is a newer version of uh, Helvetica, Neue Helvetica. So what did they do? Uh, this is just a screen image, but uh, here's the pro complete family. It has 59 fonts. As you can see, ultralight, italic, thin, thin, light, light, italic. Yeah, it's kind of like various, uh, again, various uh, weights, so to speak, I guess. Uh, for, so for $400, you can buy uh, 53 of these uh, fonts. And you think you're in good shape, aren't we? Uh, but I'm not done yet. Let's go here. So here are the, uh, and I did this, uh, this is small on, to, on purpose. Uh, so you continue at uh, myfont.com and you screen down, you got another one, another one, and another one. You have seven more screens with uh, all of these um, different typefaces, standard basic, condensed, condensed uh, family, you know, complete family, pan-European, uh, pro-basic, uh, even the Twitter brand pack down here. And uh, each one of these has, um, you know, another 50 or 20 more that are just listed there. And each one will have uh, a package price for you. So by the time you buy all of this, I'm sure you're close to spending maybe a thousand or $2,000. So it doesn't stop, you know, when you set out to create a um, typeface, uh, you need to cover the world. These are, you know, universal global typefaces now. And um, again, you know, using, you know, standard uh, our Roman alphabet, so to speak, or the alphabet we know in English and most uh, uh, romance-based languages or Germanic languages, um, this is what they use. But you've got a lot of work ahead of yourself. And it's just unbelievable then what you can pick and choose for whatever your project may require. So uh, that's uh, go to myfont.com and uh, type in a famous typeface like this, and you'll see how it goes on. But back in the good old days when people made this by hand, by casting lead, um, you know, tin and altimony, um, this is what you got. Uh, kind of handy, right? This is William Caslon, English um, font uh, designer and uh, typesetter. And he, uh, this would be the broadsheet. This is uh, how he would advertise all the different uh, types, uh, typesets you could buy from him. See all the different um, sizes even all the way down here, how tiny can you get, right? This would be set by hand. Could you imagine doing that? Picking little bits of lead, you know, whatever to do that. And then what does he do that um, even Noya Havelica didn't do over here in this column? Anybody recognize any of the languages here? Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek. Somebody created all these little sorts so that these could be purchased and uh, used in uh, whatever whatever you had to uh, print everything else is written in latin here of course but uh, it's I fantastic like there's more symbols too yeah you're right down here sort of like um, i would call them borders i don't know if that's the proper name but down way down here he would have created borders which you can buy today even still so we're, if you go to myfonts.com, they uh, advertise they have 130,000 fonts uh, that you can purchase online. So I did a quick calculation here. It certainly is not linear. It would be exponential, but oh, 250 business days a year, 35 years. Let's start 1985 with digital font capability up to uh, 2020. They have those number of business days. They have the number of uh, fonts. Uh, I don't know, people are turning out 15 fonts a business day. I mean, this is unbelievable, wouldn't you think? <laughs> It'd be interesting to go to my fonts because they do publish the uh, publication date of a font, and um, they, that would be a lot of work, but they, they could probably do it and get, you know, how many fonts were published on any particular day. Uh, so it's quite fascinating what's happened in the uh, digital revolution here compared to what William had to uh, do with or had to offer. Okay, back to the book a little bit. Here's the author, Simon Garfield, English. Um, go to his site, very handsome site. He's uh, written 19 books and uh, he's been active as a journal and journalistic entries on the site also. 
He did some editing and documentary script writing for um, BBC and attended the London School of Economics. So has a great background and uh, a long uh, time focus and professional focus on writing and uh, investigating you know, interesting topics. So that comes to um, the genre. Um, there's a lot of these books, you know, if you think about it, not just by him, um, our author, but by many and many other authors, and they're all kind of popular in a sense, right? Um, they're, they're not fictional, but they're not academic. They kind of maybe uh, sit in the middle of this uh, uh, broad-based uh, popularity area for uh, those of us in lifelong learning or leisure learning, right? Um, usually, you know, readily available, not that expensive, uh, often uh, discounted prices if you buy them used. And um, uh, sort of a quick read, a pleasure to read, you learn a lot, right? And um, kind of, uh, you know, you know something more. Uh, but you don't, can you go further into the, uh, into the, any one of these topics? Yes, you certainly can, but you may be uh, very happy with um, what you've just read, or you uh, may use it as a jump off point. So I don't know how you would define the genre. Um, haven't looked at it that closely, but I think it's uh, curious. Uh, these things have kind of become very popular, you know, uh, over the past several years. So they're all there. It's like the Da Vinci Code, which is fiction, you know, but based on supposedly real things, right? Okay, and the audience, here we are. Uh, do we identify with any one of these audiences? Um, maybe me down here in the lower right-hand corner, going to sleep during class or whatever. So I don't know. Um, those people that are casually interested, uh, certainly for students of graphic design, it's a great introduction to typography. Uh, would the dour looking people here in the academic world, would they find it interesting? This type of book, they may find it interesting, they may read it, but they would certainly want to pass on to something that has a more um, uh, beef to it, so to speak, or is a deeper academically. Would college students find it interesting? Yeah, possibly, after the game, maybe, or do other things. Uh, busy travelers like us in airports, this, this is where you find these type of books mostly in those um, you know, uh, little uh, gift shops or little stores in the airports, and they also often have those uh, displays right that out there that you can grab and go. Or, you know, uh, does it make for good um, uh, banter at the cocktail party? Yeah, it sure does. You can just say, well, I've been reading this book about type or font, and uh, introduce some sort of ideas to your friends around you. I'm not sure, you know, uh, audience genre, I think uh, that's popular, they're selling, so it must be out there. Okay, here's some of the topics that um, the author uh, investigates for us uh, throughout the book. And there are many, many of these things. I mean, it goes at a very quick clip and uh, he explores, uh, which is fascinating about the book. He goes in all different directions. It's not a historical review or anything like that. He jumps back and forth. And uh, one of the topics is overall signage, especially road signage. So now, you know, when we're on our interstates or highways, we have pretty, pretty you know, tight and consistent and recognizable uh, font, correct, that's used uh, uh, throughout the United States and in fact, you know, universally too. Oh, you know, you're in the airport, you know, a subway, any sort of public space will have something that's fairly um, universal or pretty recognizable. You may not know the font, but you're somewhat comfortable in seeing it. But before they did all of uh, this sort of um, uh, improvement, if you, if you would say that, uh, there were many, many different type uh, fonts and typefaces used uh, in all sorts of, you know, public, I'm not talking about commercial, you know, like restaurants or whatever, but uh, for public spaces, public direction, public information, it was like a mishmash, apparently, uh, up through the 50s and whatever. So they had a contest in England to come up with a font or typeface that they would use universally on their uh, road system uh, for signage. And they had two entrants uh, to it. Uh, here are the two examples. I found uh, these uh, screenshots on the internet. And um, anybody have any particular preference for one or the other and why? Do they look, eh, one or, you know, flip of the coin or do you think uh, one is better? What do you? I like the one on the right with the spacing in between. Spacing? The, yeah. 
Yeah, those long words that you want to be able to see better at a glance, not yeah. take up so much horizontal width. Uh, chat says sans serif fonts easier to read. Yeah, I agree. It's sans serif fonts better. Uh, those are some comments in the chat. Yeah. Also, good. as far as interest, I think I didn't get a chance to bring this up. It sounds like he talks a lot about cultures and fonts. Yeah. And actually, that would interest a lot of people because not many textbooks or anything go into that. <laughs> that's actually one of the reasons I'm here because that's like a very valuable topic to learn about because that's not necessarily something you learn about in school so like a lot of designers would be really drawn to this book for that reason mm -hmm. that's not something you see every day yeah that's a great observation uh, he's just uh, this is not the academic approach to type or the how do you do it approach to type or you know the historical approach it uh, it does have historical perspective but it will talk about culture, uh, you know, the people that designed this, uh, their backgrounds, their in, what influenced them, the contests they had with each other, you know, the, the uh, camaraderie, but also the uh, con uh, contests they would have. Uh, so it is fascinating that way. And uh, he focuses on, uh, you know, German, Austrian, French, and English uh, type designers. Uh, and there's uh, one mention of um, one or two American type designers. Uh, he's English himself, so I guess that would be his um, kind of, you know, area of focus, and maybe those are the best documented or researched uh, designers also over time. Uh, but uh, I agree with you totally. This is a great way of understanding type from a cultural perspective. Yeah, because having worked with different demographics is definitely yeah. very different. Yeah, exactly. You have to know your, your client. That's correct. Your audience. Yeah. So this was a contest again in England, uh, somehow the English transportation road system like our interstate, you know, uh, saw the need for universal design and signs. And in fact, um, most of you, if you pick the right hand side, uh, you're picking the winner. Uh, as you can see up here, uh, the left hand side, which was designed by a noted type designer, English type designer. Um, the, the type itself, uh, it's all cap versus, you know, what we would normally read, correct? Uh, good observation about, um, you know, I mean, are we looking for a wad, water, Watford, Birmingham, or are we looking for Watford apart from Birmingham? Uh, Birmingham, I guess, sorry. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, it doesn't line up with the, um, the uh, circle here or the whatever, you know, that they would drive through. Uh, the, uh, alignment of the M1 or the route number, you know, with the, uh, the route name isn't clear as clear here as it is over here. Now, granted, maybe they have a bigger sign, so maybe they got by with that, but uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. So you're correct. Um, if you liked the uh, right-hand side, it's called transport type. I guess they still want it. Leads the day, and it was a uh, 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 created in 1957 by Kinnear and Calvert as a team and uh, was submitted to the contest. This is David kind Kindersley. Uh, again, he was a famous type uh, designer, English type designer of the early, uh, you know, 19th century, 20th century, sorry. And, um, but it's the road sign not followed. So uh, again, in terms of, you know, the audience, the project, the uh, goals, the objectives, uh, you know, kind of think of the variables you have to uh, keep in mind as you um, as you would sit down to design a type for, um, you know, interstate um, highway. Uh, you know, the distance you can read it from, the speed you're going, uh, this idea of readability, whatever that may be, the overall design. And then, of course, you know, as you're driving down the road at so many miles per hour or kilometers per hour, you have to um, make a decision. You know, which one am I going to go? I need to go here, but how do I get there? So you have to quickly understand uh, which arrow leads you where and how you get there. So you have to make a very quick decision um, while you're driving. If you don't figure it out, then, well, you guess you go around the circle a few times. Speaking of arrow, the first one doesn't have actual arrows. It just lines up with the tags, and the second one has arrows. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I don't know. You know, these are maybe shorthand reproductions from the, uh, the web, you know, we'd have to go back maybe and do the original research to see which, uh, uh, maybe this has been cut uh, or maybe the designer cut it, maybe David cut it that way and thought it was good enough. Maybe they were given this, you know, 
design here to show the um, relative paths of the roads. Maybe they invented it themselves or something. That's a good point. It's all good stuff for um, art historian researchers or design researchers, right? All right, here we go. Um, everybody loves, knows and loves Ikea, I guess. Um, most of us maybe about something there. Fascinating um, environment to go in. You pick it out, you go get it yourself, you check out, you put it together. How easy is that? I mean, the store does nothing but stock, right? <laughs> they get to make a lot of money by just stocking the stuff. Uh, but this apparently uh, caused a ruckus. It's another little example from the book. Uh, they used a Futura uh, in the past, and then in 2019, they changed to Verdana, bold, pro bold from a Futura pro bold. And I think you can see exactly, I don't know, if why, would you be upset at that? Would you refuse boycott the, uh, IKEA and never shop there again if, uh, if you were in love with Futura and uh, you saw that they did a sneaky uh, thing to us and uh, came up with a new type uh, or adopted a new type. I don't know. Any differences between the, I copied these from myfont.com and they're both at 90 points. I think you can see, even though they look, oh, I mean, the A's are almost exactly the same, right? How about the uh, E's? Comment in the chat, it's less pleasing to look at. Which um, one? That's a great point, doesn't say. Um, I think probably the newer one. I know this. Oh, and yes, pointing out the slabs on the eye in Verdana is totally different from what I grew up with. So I didn't even notice that they had changed it. I dislike change. So I prefer Futura because that's what I know as like Ikea. Uh-huh. Yeah, I guess. Not that, only, that. sorry, not only do I know like the change, it just kind of looks like they stretched it out without doing it proportionally. It just like looks like they just stretched out and photoshopped and didn't hold down shift. Like with <laughs> the spacing and the and the width. Yeah, so um, I don't know how to control that. Uh, again, I went to my fonts and I just typed in the- No, um, no, no, that's so not that's why the, you the... did. That's what it makes it look like when they change the font. Like that's what the new font looks like. Uh -huh. And those are some of the other comments in the chat. So yeah. Verdana is not exactly a new font and the kerning is quieter with the yeah. bottom example. Yeah. And another comment is that the kerning is definitely off. Um, another comment that I prefer the openness of Verdana. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is some a comment for it. Um, so those are some of the other comments in chat. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it was so, so long that I couldn't even get the E here. I didn't misspell it on purpose, but the, the E dropped off in the... Uh, on myfonts.com, you can type in a phrase, you know, you can pick a font, type in the phrase, and then increase or decrease the size, and it has a window, you know, that'll immediately uh, change for you, and uh, it's, great. it's a great little tool to just kind of get a, a sense of um, design sense of what something will look like when it's small and large, yeah. Well, I don't know if it stopped anybody from uh, buying there, but um, people did notice it, and uh, unfortunately, it was tagged by the New York Times, the biggest controversy ever to come out of Sweden, so I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of a put down to Sweden, isn't it? Uh, where my wife is from, so <laughs> she's not in the room. Very interesting. And then, um, again, there are so many uh, examples to go through, um, but this one kind of struck me, in fact, this morning when I was finishing this, that we have two uh, major milestones in type and printing, correct? Uh, certainly Gutenberg, right, with his Bible, and then uh, Steve Jobs with the Mac. And uh, you can find, uh, if you go to my fonts, you can find a, a uh, font that's uh, after Gutenberg by Altera uh, Litera, and uh, you can buy that. I don't think it was that expensive. Uh, if you go to my fonts, I don't think you can find the famous Chicago font that was uh, commissioned by Apple and designed by Susan Carr. Uh, it ran on the Apple Mac platform, I guess, uh, from 84 to 97. I don't use a Mac, I'm not familiar with it, but I think everybody kind of remembers this, um, these quirky um, pixelated uh, fonts from many decades ago. So I thought it was uh, interesting that uh, both of them changed the world, right? I mean, if there are two significant milestones, it would be Gutenberg started the whole thing, Apple um, restarted the whole thing, right? I mean, everything is just done over again uh, with uh, the Macintosh, particularly 
of course, it's spread to the, um, you know, uh, the other uh, I, uh, OS and other platforms uh, pretty quickly. But uh, this is why we have so many fonts, because the Mac in 84 was designed with a couple of drop down fonts that you could select from. I never used it, but I've read about it. Uh, interesting, but before that, you didn't have that. Uh, before Gutenberg, we didn't have any printing at all and type like we do. Uh, it's not really a theme of the book, but it struck me as being pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, they changed the world, but would we use either of these today? Uh, I don't know. You know, for effects, I guess. I guess you can buy Chicago from rip off some somewhere or another. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't think we'd ever really use them again, would we? But they were the start of uh, two revolutions. And a great comment in the chat is that Chicago optimized for monitors and printers of the time. That's correct. Yeah. So like That's Gutenberg, correct. we don't write that way anymore, but that was very of its time. So yep. yes, these are of different eras and they are their time and place. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if you come up with anything new, you're kind of um, in a time trap uh, to uh, some sort, aren't you? Because you're really kind of leverage, what, leveraging what's already there and what is popular and understood to a degree. That's what Gutenberg did, of course, with his, like he could have designed it any way he wanted to, couldn't he? I mean, I mean he made all these himself or his uh, team put all these together, but they harken back to what people were reading at the time, correct? Uh, what people were used to. So uh, to, uh, I suppose, get a better entry into the market, that's uh, the decision they made and maybe the same here. So yeah, great comment though. Okay, um, there's one oddity to the book. I found it, found it odd, uh, but interesting uh, nonetheless that uh, usually you, you read a book and it has a forward to it, correct? Uh, and usually it's kind of a dry type of uh, thing, you know, where they talk about this or that or some, you know, experts been asked to introduce the, uh, the book, et cetera. So kind of the same here, but uh, the introduction is by Chip Kidd. And if you get the book physically, it's like the first thing, you, the first few pages you, you come across this. It's like an essay. And it goes over many different pages. And um, he's using, it's kind of neat. He, he shows the old TV show names from the 60s. Uh, he shows uh, sales ads from newspapers. He uh, includes stock quotes and uh, these type of illustrations. I think what Mr. Kidd is attempting to do is to show us the variety of uh, type and font and uh, the different uses uh, with it. Um, so I didn't know anything about him. I looked him up and he's a famous graphic designer, uh, particularly of um, book covers. And I think he um, worked for uh, one of the big publishing companies, and maybe he still does. And he went to uh, Pennsylvania, my home state. Uh, I think uh, Penn State, one of the campuses there. Uh, he's been doing it for a long, long time. So you can go to his uh, website and see all the uh, book covers he's designed. So kind of, I just it, it kind of it's an interesting uh, break. It's uh, different. It, it confused me because then I thought, well, is he also writing stuff in the book, right? That's not clear uh, that here's what I did and everything is done by Simon, you know, uh, or is this a collaborative uh, uh, effort on the two of them? That kind of threw me a little bit, but uh, I, I guess it's clear after um, you look at it. And I can it's, share on my screen real quick, if you see on my video, here's an example yeah. of that. So it looks like a newsprint page, but mm -hmm. the actual part of the forward that um, Chip has written is here. And when you turn the page, there is more of it. So that page was newspaper. This is, we don't see this much anymore, but the stock listings. And so bits of the forward are hidden on each of these pages as his different layouts. So every page is a different treat. And at first it's easy to skip past them, trying to get to the actual written content. And it took me as well a second viewing uh, going back and then trying to find the narrative within it. So it's almost mm -hmm. like a scavenger hunt, the forward. And I really enjoyed that as well. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of neat. All right, a, a couple of uh, pros and cons. If you go through this or if you'd like to um, uh, give this uh, some consideration, here's a few. Uh, writing is very clear, easy to read, pithy. He's English and so he's using English, English, English. All right, there'll be a couple of words that we normally don't here in American English. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, syntax may be a little different, but you know, not substantially so, but uh, very clear um, to read. Uh, this is a type of book you can read a chapter and uh, jump around. There are two types of chapters. One is the longer chapter that uh, goes into the, uh, the details about 
that particular topic in the chapter. And then he has these uh, interim chapters called uh, sort of a focus on a font where he'll take a particular font, talk about the personality and history of that font and what happens around it, the more you know popular fonts uh, that we've had. So that's kind of, you know, kind of a neat way of uh, arranging the book and breaking up the text. Again, I mentioned uh, the focus is really uh, limited on Western European countries and not all of them. There's nothing about Spain, for example, or Italy, uh, you know, Scandinavia, but uh, so it's very central Europe and English. Uh, that's okay. Um, you know, those are important uh, typefaces that we've worked with. They've become somewhat universal, but um, I don't know. Uh, th this is not a book on Gutenberg or Jobs or, you know, anybody. It's not a deep dive on any particular um, type designer. And it's not, you know, historical in that sense either. But he makes the, these designers human with their uh, going over their interesting personalities or quirks and things like that, their um, successes and their failures. So it's very much um, humanizes the topic, which maybe other books haven't done. Illustrations are okay, um, gray tone. I'm you know, thinking about my um, paperback uh, copy and mine is yellowing already. It's uh, they published about 10 years ago and they cover a lot of font. So what is kind of interesting and uh, sleep aid possibly, but <laughs> pick a page and uh, read everything on the page or the chapter and then go to Wikipedia and look up, you know, all the references, uh, the names, the type, a year or something like that. And uh, you I mean, you'll be surprised at the amount of content that he gets into any one page or chapter. It's really pretty dense if you want to uh, go a little deeper. It's an easy way, an easy thing to do too. And it um, you know, will expand your understanding uh, quite nicely. Cons, uh, again, you know, if you're looking for something historical step-by-step, step, uh, this is not it, but that makes it interesting. And as I mentioned, there's just nothing around by Hispanic. I mean, you know, Spain, I mentioned uh, nothing from Latin America, Mexico, Canada, Australia, Africa, Asia, even Eastern Europe. No mention of those types or people that may be involved in those types, type design, et cetera. Maybe it's just too much uh, to cover in a book like this. And uh, just a few from the US also. Uh, he kind of, uh, you know, puts his foot, uh, you know, in the water a little bit by uh, on the notion of when a font is a logo or a logo is a font, uh, like Ford or Coca-Cola. These are not, you know, it's not a complete family um, of Ford, all the other letters of the alphabet spelled out in the Ford style, like you see in their logo, uh, the same with Coca-Cola. Um, he does talk about the Beatles though, um, as a um, font um, or kind of a logo font, you know, the, uh, from the, uh, their um, albums in the 60s, you know, the Beatles that were on the, uh, I should have gotten a screen clipping for you, but uh, the one that's on their drum, right, as they opposed around the drum. So if you're looking for, you know, if you want to get into logo type stuff, uh, this, uh, the book doesn't cover uh, that in any great detail. And then uh, I don't know, there could be another book about all the font foundries, you know, the digital font foundries, like um, my fonts, you know, people Linotype and monotype are still producing all of these. Uh, well, not them, but other individuals or small uh, boutique uh, digital font um, companies are producing these, and then they're being distributed by the uh, the foundries. You know that were dealing in um, sorts a couple of decades ago that converted to digital, and they're being distributed that way. I think that whole thing would be kind of a fascinating study in and of itself. And uh, the whole notion of going just online and buying stuff like uh, you can at my fonts and linotype and monotype, et cetera. And uh, the illustrations are limited. You know, it's not designed to be an illustrative uh, work. And another con, while it covers hundreds of fonts, <laughs> it's like too much. Uh, what it doesn't do though, is uh, what other uh, books will do. And that will be giving you a, a pangram of sorts, you know, supposedly a catchy phrase that includes all the uh, letters, at least of the English alphabet in this case. Um, and there's a couple of them out there. And none are, are perfect because you have to repeat certain letters. You just can't get away with using one letter once other than the alphabet itself. Uh, this one may be, oh, may be questionable and you know, play, playing jazz five chords quickly excites my wife. Okay. But here's Benton Sands around 1900. Go all the way back to Saban, which um, We'll see the author of that, but originally from the 1500s, revised in the 1960s. Here's Baskerville, um, English font from the 1750s. 
Here's Universe, another one of the global fonts from 1957. But what the book does not do, and I don't think it's the intent of the book, is to show you, you know, um, the entirety of a font, right? They'll show you letters of the font as illustrations, but they kind of get lost. And it's really hard to understand, well, what is different between all these fonts when you can't line up, you know, exactly the same, say, sentence and, and begin to look what's going on. So, and I think that's one of the things about studying fonts, which is so much fun. If you think studying fonts is fun, maybe not. So what would you read next? Um, what I'd recommend is this uh, from Gutenberg to OpenType. So this is like the historical review, page by page. It'll either be a two page or a four page uh, spread on uh, the uh, type designers like Gutenberg, what they did, uh, the fonts you know they used and how they were adopted or changed over time. So if you wanna start uh, with um, at ground zero and move forward, uh, this is a great one to have. In fact, it would be good to have while you're reading because if you find a font uh, of particular interest or discussion in um, uh, the one where the book we're discussing here, you know, uh, by Simon, you would then could open this book up and turn to that page and read more deeply about it. And what you will see there is sort of, you know, the alphabet, the numbers of the font and everything like that. And then what you can do is quickly page between the different fonts and see the differences that way. So this would fill a, a fantastic uh, visual and design gap that we have in the uh, current book. And there's a couple of others here. Uh, anything that Ellen Lupton writes is um, uh, worth buying and reading. They're kind of only used at this point. I don't know if they're current, but she's a graphic designer, I think uh, based in Florida, one of the universities in Florida. But Anything you can find uh, that she wrote is great. She's written on proportion and everything like that. And then if you want to get to the more academic area uh, down here, a very short introduction. This is from Oxford, and they have like 250 books of these uh, very short introductions. And they are short, but they're beautifully printed, actually. And But they're very dense. You get into this thing, and it's um, very uh, thick. This is not popular reading. But if you really want to get into a topic, and again, 250 different topics, just pick a topic and you'll find something. Uh, they're excellent little books to buy and, um, and uh, hack your way through them. Very good. So I don't know, this is my bad excuse at some weird design, but <laughs> if we have anything else in the chat or any comments you'd like to um, share or questions. So if we're looking at typeface, I know it's half typeface, half programming language, but does anyone have a point of view on LaTeX? Could you repeat that, Sage? I know it's only half typeface and it's partially programming languages, but does anyone have a point of view on LaTeX? LaTeX? Yeah, it's also presented on LaTeX. Latex. It's the typeface you use to do like mathematical and scientific research papers and stuff. Ah. Like it has all the symbols and the lining mm -hmm. up and such. I just thought I'd bring it up and see if yeah. anyone else knew about it. Yeah, that's fascinating. LaTeX. Uh, it's certainly not covered in the book, but you're right. Just think of, you know, your books uh, in science and math, uh, all the uh, glyphs you would have to create. Uh, to, uh, you know, yeah, correctly. it's interesting because there's yep. like 10 fonts within the typeface, mm -hmm. but you're, you you kind of have to program to use mm -hmm. it. Yep. But it has like its own typeface. Sure. I thought people would be interested in that. Anyone have any familiarity or interest there? I'm afraid I don't, but anyone else? No, it sounds know. interesting. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, that's a great idea is to go either to the bookstore and just stand there and get uh, calculus one or whatever and page through it and see all the different uh, glyphs that are used to convey mathematics and equations, etc. Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. And yeah, you're right. It so. actually uses its own type interface system that you can get for free. It oh. doesn't even use Word or anything like it you type with it's like a text editor still okay but it, it looks almost like word but you can also go on that looks like text edit mm -hmm. it's very interesting if you're into typefaces just to learn a little about oh yeah absolutely 
Yeah, we mentioned, I think, what, uh, 500, 600 glyphs, you know, for uh, Microsoft, but I don't know. That's a great question. They, they do have, um, we could look it up on the web. I've looked at it. They have a table of what uh, that, uh, the glyphs that would include. So it probably does include, you know, you can, uh, some fonts will give you a, a fraction like one over two, you know, as a glyph, correct? You don't have to write one slash two. Um, you can type one over two and it'll come in, I guess, for, so for easier mathematics, um, you know, setting type or uh, whatever in mathematics. So I think that would be quite interesting. Any other ideas? So we want you to visit the printing museum. It's here in Houston, been here 40, for 40 years. And uh, go to the website, printingmuseum.org. question. Yep, go ahead. You sort of have studio space. How does that work? Because I'm actually a graphic designer. Absolutely. So uh, Jessica Snow, the manager, studio manager is online, but go to the website and then look up the studio sessions. They have paper making. She's in charge of letterpress. That's where you would set type with uh, the, the lead type. Uh, there are printing uh, events, printing, um, you know, uh, uh, studio events, uh, bookmaking. Adrienne is... Uh, yeah, so in, in addition yeah. to our um, museum portion, we also have our working artist studios. So we offer lots of different workshops that people can take, as well as the ability to take private classes. And then once you are certified and you've taken so many hours, uh, renting our space through the open studio program is also another option for making use of our resources here. So those are all options and you can find out more about those too on our website and we hope people do. We love sharing our workspace, you know, that's, we're here to be a community resource. And uh, just uh, here are some of the photos as uh, we've mentioned the studio uh, setting at the, uh, within the uh, museum. These are the uh, operating uh, presses here. Um, here in fact is the sorts, right? Uh, here are some wooden sorts or metal over here, additional metal ones with illustrations, wooden font, uh, the furniture you use in uh, setting your type, uh, you know, the cases, the cabinets, etc. So um, it's a great place. Yep. Uh, there's lots going on. So if you haven't been with us in person or at least take a look at uh, the website and uh, plan to attend some of the uh, future events and studios. I think we're good to close. Uh, here we go. Um, hope you enjoyed our time together. Uh, the printer is going to uh, compose with sorts and we want you to all print along. So thank you very much. <laughs>